Okay. Uh, welcome. I'm Donald Davidoff, co-founder and CEO of Real Estate Business Analytics, here for our inaugural episode of The People Behind the Performance, where I sit down with key industry leaders to dive into what's driving the real estate industry's success, the role data plays in it, and tell the stories of the people behind it all. I'm here today with guest David Stanford, who is the founder and executive managing consultant of Real Foundations. Real Foundations is a professional services firm founded in 2000, focused on helping companies uh, that develop, build, own, operate, service, occupy, or invest in real estate make smarter, more profitable decisions, essentially making real estate run better. David leads Real Foundations owner, operator, and institutional investor practices, and he's also responsible for the corporate development activities of the firm. That includes implementing the global pre presence of the firm across Europe, Asia, and Australia. David has more than 30 years of combined experience. Boy, you started uh, long ago, uh, as did I. Uh, I guess that just means we're old. Yeah. Uh, but all that, all that experience in providing strategic financial and operational improvement services to clients in the property and building industry. Prior to starting Real Foundations, he was the managing partner of Ernst & Young's real estate practice in Dallas and also worked in the transaction advisory group of Kenneth Leventhal and Company. David graduated from Baylor University with a bachelor's degree in accounting and finance, and thus probably already has his NCA brackets completely busted by now. Sorry about yeah. that. Oh, well. Welcome, David. Let's dive right in. So as you think about the state of the industry today, what's on your mind? Well, Donald, thank you for having me. I'm flattered to be the first. That was certainly a mouthful, and it proves that I've just been hanging around the hoop for a while. Uh, and yes, all the brackets are all destroyed now from from this weekend. So, oh well, it is what it is. So, other than that, what's on your mind? Um, so, from a from a residential standpoint, it's interesting. I was just listening to uh, a call that we had last Friday, and uh, it was uh, announcing what we're doing with customer experience. Uh, across residential and this uh, sort of convergence, if you will, of housing choices, mm -hmm. unlike there's ever been before. Um, home builders, multifamily companies, single family rental companies, build for rent companies are now in each other's spaces, mm -hmm. attending conferences and all learning and competing with each other and uh, certainly brings a very interesting dynamic uh, coupled with the acute housing shortage that a lot of people are talking about uh, and uh, kind of a 10-year horizon of opportunity to sort of transform and improve housing choices for uh, Americans for the next 10 years. Yeah, no, it is. It is absolutely fascinating at, uh, at NMHC's <clears throat> annual meeting, you know, to see these multi-housing companies on stage talking about their build to rent. And, you yeah. know, I've done some work in the single family space. You've done even more. Um, it is amazing. This thing that I thought was a trade coming out of 2009 yeah. is a massive business and everybody's uh, piling in right now. Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's turn a little bit to your personal background. What made you take the plunge and start Real Foundations 22 years ago? Now that's easy. There was a transaction. Mm -hmm. So uh, at the time, some of your listeners will uh, remember that the SEC was forcing. So I worked with Ernst & Young, uh, one of the big four accounting shops, and the SEC was forcing the separation mm -hmm. of accounting and consulting. And uh, Ernst & Young uh, was one of the first to take the plunge and they sold their consulting business to uh, Capgemini out of okay. France. I remember that. We decided we didn't want to do that. We liked what we were doing, helping real estate companies run better. And basically it broke inertia. EY was a great place. We learned a lot mm -hmm. there. And uh, we decided to go out in the spring of 2000 and raise a little bit of capital and got ourselves in business on uh, June 2nd, I believe, 2000. Wow, that is, that that yeah, it's amazing how um, different things you know, cause the spark to make something happen. Yeah. So if you think, so if you think about it now, what is one thing that 2022's David knows now and wishes could go back and teach 2000, right? June 2nd, 2000, David, at the start of that adventure that 
David in 2000 didn't know back then, but David 2022 does know. I think there are probably a couple things. Uh, number one, um, how how similar real estate, different sectors operate across the world. Mm-hmm. We didn't we didn't really know that at all then. Um, and had we known that, we'd probably been more aggressive on an international standpoint. Uh, and we've we've learned that slowly over time. And you know we've worked in over forty countries in the last whatever twenty plus years. But uh, that's that's been a a learning process. And I wish I would have been more aggressive about that at the start. And I think the other thing that was <clears throat> that has been also a slow learning is the power of the 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 work over distance method mm-hmm. and network that we already had when mm-hmm. we started so it was myself and and two other founders uh chris Shada and mark callan and a number of people that we had worked with previously all in different places mm-hmm. and we didn't have stuff like this but we had phones and didn't have an iphone yet but the ability to run that business over distance Mm -hmm. uh, and continue to scale the firm was something we didn't really recognize that as an asset and it's really hard to do Mm -hmm. and we just we were lucky because we were we brought it from a structure that already had it in place Mm -hmm. and that's been a, a really good asset for us um, yeah. over time. And I didn't really know how hard that was to do. Yeah. I mean, that's particularly impressive for obviously being prepared with what happened with COVID. I mean, yeah. I know, I know at Reba, it's really interesting. I mean, the pro forma that we had back when we made our, you know, raised our angel round in December, 2019, mm-hmm. assumed that within a year or two, we would get an office. And, yeah. you know, we just did our A round, uh, last quarter and we actually, um, took any notion of office rent out of the picture. Did First you? of all, I can tell you as a startup guy, it's kind of cool not to have rent and uh, as much in the way of furnitures and fixtures. Um, right. That certainly helps the P&L. But from a recruiting standpoint, I mean, what we learned um, both during and even after COVID is when you're trying to compete for tech folks, mm-hmm. um, you know, to start the interview with, you don't have to move. Right? Right. Not only do I, I don't have to pay to move you, and you don't mm-hmm. have to move. Um, I mean, I, I would say almost every person that we have as an employee, if we had forced them to move to Denver, they wouldn't have joined. So yep. it, it is truly amazing. And in fact, I, I just earlier uh, or late last week on a new job requisition, I got a, I got a, uh, the first time I saw a resume that at the top said remote positions only. So like, really? you know, the resume person is is saying that. Um, uh-huh. So yeah, so what when when you think about all that, um, when you think about that career that you've been through, who uh, who has been your most influential professional mentor? Who who did who did you look up to? Who taught you? Who, you know, we all have maybe even more than one person who we're so grateful for for the opportunity to learn from them. Who who's that in your career? What did they teach you? Right. Uh, first of all, I'd probably have to say my mom. Uh, mm-hmm. She still. Uh, scoops us on industry data uh-huh she's a former third grade teacher and she actually got us into a lot of this work over distance stuff mm-hmm. uh, in the kind of mid to late 2000s um so that's kind of interesting and she has helped keep me grounded and um help me complete projects because i'm a i'm a project starter and i don't finish a lot uh-huh. of things. So it's good because yep. I have a lot of capability, capable uh, people here that help do that. Um, I think uh, there, there are a number of leaders from uh, Kenneth Leventhal that I look to. Mr. Leventhal himself, um, Stan Ross, Dale Reese were early mentors of mine. We learned a tremendous amount from them. And have tried to build a lot of that into into our firm going forward. Um, and then, frankly, you know, I learned so much from Chris and Mark over our thirty plus years together. Mm-hmm. We're all very different people, and uh, they have been significant influences uh, 
uh, on my career. Yeah, talk, talk to me a little bit of that relationship. I mean, I, um, you know, I work with some musicians on the side, mm-hmm. and um, many of the duos that I've worked with, uh, the ones that have been around a long time, describe it kind of like a, kind of like a, a, a marriage, an old time marriage. In fact, yeah. uh, one of them would joke from the stage, it's uh, it's just like an old time marriage. We bicker like hell. Um, you know, we've been around forever, and there's absolutely no sex. Uh, so, you know, it's sort of funny coming from an artist. And then I think about, again, my experience with Reba right now. I mean, you know, Chris Bress, one of my two founding partners, mm-hmm. while the company's only two years old, you know, he and I met each other first in 1999, mm-hmm. working on LRO, right? So we've mm-hmm. been 23 years old and, you know, incredible amount of respect, sometimes get into the stupidest arguments, you know, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But, but, you know, 23 years, you just can't substitute for that so right. yeah, talk a little bit about your relationship i mean you've got a 30-year three-way marriage as it were almost yeah it's all and it's probably a little bit more than that there's a couple other uh folks dan stirk and phil mm-hmm. mccorkle i've been with you know yeah. their entire careers as well so uh to start with you know chris and mark and i were all very different personalities um Chris is the sort of the deeper thinker, never forgets okay. anything, um, much more articulate than me. Uh, and Mark was very action oriented, kind of into the operational details day to day. And I'm more of a connector. Mm-hmm. I like to, you know, connect, you know, people and ideas that are not obvious, kind of like some of the S- early SFR stuff I was running around. Mm-hmm you know, trying to connect people to that. They were like saying, just get out of here. Um, So, so those differences in the kind of geographic distance probably kept us apart uh, from like hurting each other sometimes. (laughs) Um, And then with, uh, with both Dan and Phil, we're a little bit more like the, the brothers. Mm -hmm. Uh, We do bicker from time to time, but they both, uh, you know, teach me and push me and yep. we push each other, other and it's, you know, it's just a great mix of, uh, personalities, yep. um, and capabilities that all kind of work. And, you know, that's yeah. a wonderful asset to have. It's very <laughs> hard to recreate. Yeah, no, it is. Well, and, and like I said, I mean, nothing substitutes for just the number of years, the rubber on the road. Um, but I, I know throughout my career, I've always done better when I've got a yin yang with someone than when I'm on my own, you know, it's just, it's too easy to get caught up in your own, you know, point of view. And then somebody else who thinks about the world a little differently tells you something and you just go, duh, I'm sort of embarrassed. I didn't think about that. So it's, it's always good to have people like that around. Right. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a little bit of a challenge these days mm -hmm. in this, the working, working over distance world. Yeah. You mentioned the sort of the office real estate situation and our, our office occupancy costs is way down um, significantly, but mm-hmm. you know, that's something that is now filtering its way into a lot of client conversations. Like how do you yep. go forward yep. and how do you, how do you create that sense of team and culture with increased flexibility that is demanded th- today? Yeah, no, I mean, the flexibility is great, but I do worry <laughs> about how culture can atrophy and how you onboard new people. You know, when, when, when COVID started, Okay, we all went home, but we all knew each other. So mm-hmm. there, yeah. there was relationships. So yeah, you I mean, you've been talking about how that was actually one of the things you'd even wish 20 years ago you you knew more about how to do. So what what are a couple of lessons that you might share with folks who are a little less um, mature in their understanding of it, but clearly need that advice to to do a better job keeping things yeah. together at distance? You know, I think uh, one of the things that we've done is we we write a lot of things down, important messaging. We have uh, this thing we call a book of talismans. It's like things that we hold dear. Mm -hmm. And we get that out to everybody and basically, you know, try to plant ideas, seeds of ideas early in Mm -hmm. in their career. The other thing is being very purposeful and explicit about onboarding. Mm -hmm. Um, We have done a, I think, a, a really good job of that. And it's, it is more difficult now to like, try to know everybody. One thing that was really important to me pre COVID is I did a lot of management by walking around. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm the kind of person that's inquisitive and curious, and I like to know what, what people are working on. And that's, that's tougher now. You just have to be more explicit and purposeful in designing those interactions. Mm-hmm. No, that makes a ton of sense. Um, the, the message on onboarding really, really resonates. Um, the, you know, what, what's the old saying? There's, there's only one chance to make a first impression. Yep. And, um, you know, I think that's relevant, not just on the job, but our, you know, our mutual clients when it comes to onboarding a resident, mm-hmm. right? Those first, that first week. Absolutely. Those first 30 first days touch. are so critical. Exactly. You know, well, especially in leasing, right? I mean, yeah. okay, I took the, uh, you know, I, I got the nice tour when you wanted to sell me. What's it like after I've already bought? Um, right. You know, you were talking about, about ex, uh, user experience, uh, something mm-hmm. definitely gaining some traction. So, yeah, so let's let's turn our attention a little bit to sort of peel the onion on on the, the data-related elements of what's going on in our industry. So, I mean, where what do you think the future of data analytics looks like in rental housing? Well, it's... Uh... It'll be much different than it is today. Um, so the, I think the one of the lasting impacts from COVID has been the acceleration of technology mm-hmm. in the residential space by 10 years. We're pulling that mm-hmm. forward. Um, so sort of good news, bad news story. Uh, we Everyone had to react and do something immediately to sort of get through. Uh, but but now we're seeing that the consumer is, is in control of mm-hmm. the experience, even though right now it's definitely a landlord market because of the mm-hmm. housing shortage. Everybody's occupancy is really good because you're just right now. But, but that experience factor on the front end <clears throat> Mm-hmm. is is driving a lot of you know, technology need mm-hmm. and also areas of basically new measurement that we hadn't been able to measure very well before mm-hmm. um, and in taking a a much earlier view of consolidating and and analyzing what's happening from first touch yep sort of outside the tr- traditional, I have a piece of real estate and and you're going to be a customer so you just got to come to me. Mm-hmm. Um it's a it'll be a very different game plan. Yeah, what I mean when you look at the um as you said, you know, the future of data analytics is going to be a lot different than what it is today. Today's already a lot different than what it was 10 yeah. years ago. What what do you see as the biggest threat? Uh the biggest data threat out there right now, the biggest threat to what that better situation five or 10 years from now might be? I think the ability to, the, the, the capability that uh, a, a an operator, owner, investor has to aggregate mm-hmm. many, many different signals mm-hmm. uh, because we're kind of, we're kind of used to operating in a monolithic, you got a property management vendor and they do, you know, almost everything for you. Mm -hmm. And now we're receiving, you know, signals and information from lots of different sources. There's 9,000 plus new prop tech companies out there that, you know, people are trying the, the, uh, uh, assets are now telling you things Mm -hmm. from a performance standpoint that you've never been able to see before. And then, you know, how do you assimilate and aggregate that data into meaningful information. Yeah, certainly music to our ears. That's uh, that's what we're trying to do. Um, we, I mean, you you've been in the consulting business for a long time. Uh, you know, if you were talking, or you probably are actually having this conversation with clients of yours, um, where would you advise an operator, rental housing operator, is a good place to start their data journey? Well, the, the starting point is, is typically one that uh, a lot of people don't want to start with. Um, but knowing what you have, what your measures are, mm-hmm. not, not key, key APIs, not key performance measure metrics, mm-hmm. 
because the key is only a point in time. You know, mm-hmm. you need to understand what data you have, mm-hmm. how it's collected, what gaps you have, what the measurements are, like something simple like NOI, mm-hmm. lots of different meanings based on the context uh, and the point of view of the person discussing it. That's not uh, always terribly sexy place to start. Yep. But, you know, I've been at this a long time, built lots of data warehouses and whatnot that just get stale quickly. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the good starting point is knowing what you have, what you need, and then really, really understanding how you're going to keep that current yeah. and and integrate it because you're going to have, yeah. you know, in the future, uh, 10x the number of data sources yep. and probably legitimately big data especially with the kind of the building level iot mm-hmm. information that's going to going to come in and then you have all the other stuff like sentiment um customer loyalty you know what's on yelp what mm-hmm. people are saying about you in google uh that is it's really hard to get your hands around that sort of yeah. formerly unstructured data and and marry that up to mm-hmm. kind of historical backward looking stuff and then be able to predict what's going to happen in the future those predictive analytics i think we're kind of in the very early innings of yeah i think i mean it's interesting the three things i i sort of took away from what you said right the breadth of the data it's as much about day 2 day 180 day 365 Right. And so, so many projects focus on the launch, but what happens afterwards? Right. Yeah. How do you keep that data up to speed? That was a big takeaway. And then you have predictive analytics. It's, it's interesting to me about predictive analytics because I got my start in this industry on um, on a yeah. predictive analytic application. Right. Before mm-hmm. before there even were data warehouses, um, you know, Artstone, Scott Sellers had the foresight to want to do revenue management. And, you know, you know, my background yeah. LRO is how I got into the industry. I was not a rental housing person. Until then, and like many others, this industry is like a fly trap. It just catches you mm-hmm. and, and keeps you. Um, but that is predictive analytics. And to your point, not a lot of other predictive analytics have come out yet. But I see the I see the data warehouses that are starting to get built. I see um, hopefully a product like Reba helping mid-sized companies get there yeah. faster. And then once you have the data, um, you know, just ideas flow and, and and you start to come up with with applications and predictive analytics that you never would have had otherwise yeah you know i i uh i'm a big barbecue mm-hmm. person and a lot of people in barbecue talk about the first bite of really good brisket kind of aaron mm-hmm. franklin moment <clears throat> and back in uh i'm going to relate this to your career and kind of how it's all good how i had <laughs> And a epi- similar epiphany, kind of like the lunch. first bite of barbecue. I, I got lunch after this, so you're already wetting my appetite. So keep going. So uh, Phil and I were working on a project at La Quinta mm-hmm. in 99, where your old, your former company, Talos. Yeah, I remember. We're doing a revenue management thing there. Yep. We weren't involved. We were doing something else. Mm-hmm. And you know, we, we were asked to... I'll take a look at that because it was a project that was struggling um, from the client side. And the first the first time I saw it, like it was like the first bite of barbecue. It's like uh-huh. never seen anything like that. And that kind of started the the future of predictive analytics and multifamily. Mm-hmm. And it was a tough adoption. Yeah. Really, really tough because the change, the behavior change, kind of like now. Uh, self-guided touring yep because that was never going to happen very very fast yep. and then all of a sudden it happened because you had to be able to self-tour or you're not going to get any um any uh occupancy so 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 things like that the the ability to grab onto them and then use the change changes in a positive mm-hmm. direction 
figure out how to tie that to mm-hmm. NOI performance or net promoter scores or you know whatever handful of yeah. of key measures is something that I think we will continue to see linkages created. Yeah, no, it's it, it's fascinating. Uh, one of the dashboards that we've built actually takes the ORA score for mm-hmm. each property and compares it to other metrics. And for our launch customer, it was a little bit nerve wracking. The first time we turned it on, what was it going to say? And the good news <laughs> was it did say, it was very obvious visually that the better your score, the higher your occupancy. The and so there were, there were correlations. So there were absolute correlations. Now, again, you know, you got to be careful. Correlations, not causality, yeah. but it was a pretty compelling correlation to the point that you can even start to say, oh, well, if I raise my score five points, here's what it will do to my occupancy. Here's what it will mm-hmm. do to my renewal on average and begin to even, you know, decide like, well, what's that worth to me in dollars? And then what can, what can I do with that? And, you know, can you imagine in, in 2000, when you got started in this industry and, or, you know, with Rail Foundations, you started with the consulting or with the other companies even earlier. You know, my first taste of the industry was the summer of, of 99 mm-hmm. of when we started that very first uh, study that led to LRO. I mean, I, I you know, I, I feel like, I feel like we had, I feel like we were the Aborigines with fire back then, right? <laughs> and now we've got a jet engine. Um and, yeah, well, uh, one one thing about that is because we have this conversation all the time with clients. They want to build their own. Mm-hmm. They always want to build their own. Yep. And it is such a heavy lift to do. Yeah. You've got like all this other stuff. You've got, you know, customer front end stuff. You're trying to integrate technology into new and existing assets mm-hmm. that you've never done before. And you don't really know how to measure all of that and get it integrated. Yep. And then to take on something like building your own data warehouse, that's so hard to do. It takes a kind of different mindset. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the one of the promising things that you and Reba are doing is taking your years of experience and creating a very uh, significant accelerator mm-hmm. to that, uh, which we think is in most cases, the right playbook. Excellent. And, and you know, uh, the, the acceleration that that mm-hmm. will produce in the future is going to go a long way. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I mean, it, you know, Archstone was notorious for building rather than buying, mm-hmm. but it's because we were always, what we wanted was ahead of where the vendor space was. Uh-huh. And, you know, towards the end of my career, uh, a little bit before Archstone went away, I started making the case internally, like let's buy an 80 or 90% solution because it's long run easier to maintain than having all this custom software that we can only amortize over our 60,000 units. So I, the, in, that, <laughs> in that time frame, there wasn't anything else. No, right? really you wasn't. had to, but yeah. And I no, think, I think the, what, what we often talk about is the, where you really want to focus your, your building Mm-hmm. is things that that you that are that are difficult or sort of in kind of being built as they come mm-hmm. like how to build your integration capabilities right. the capability to get and move data curate yeah. that data and that's something that's very difficult to buy yeah. um, and takes takes a set of skills and capabilities mm-hmm. that I think going forward, many companies are going to have to be very, very good at yep. versus building a data warehouse or yeah. building no, a can, repository. Yeah, if you can, if you have a, a, a competency in how to get and move data around, that's useful in ways you and I don't even know today, three years from now, you're going to want to do that. Exactly. Whereas when you build your big app, well, now you're sort of stuck with it. You've got that technical debt. And three years from now, yeah. there's something better, but it's too expensive for you to change. So I I love what you just said there. Focus on the things that give you the toolbox to use in the future um, rather than trying to, you know, build the thing because other people can build that thing for you. Well, great. We're coming right up on the end of half an hour. We try to keep this to sort of 30, 35 minutes. So let's change gears completely. Now that we've done the heavy lifting, we like to end these interviews with a fun little rapid fire sort of James Lipton style Q&A. So Uh don't think too hard. Just respond quickly. I think he had 10 questions. We're just going to do six. 
Okay. What book has influenced you the most? Uh, Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, what was his first book? Uh, any of the Gladwell books are big influencers. The the very first book, can't remember the name of it, but that was about when we started mm-hmm. uh, RF, and we all read it. There were twenty or twenty five people, uh-huh. um, and it was very impactful. And for the first, I don't know, ten years of our existence, we made every new new employee read that read. book and mm-hmm. have a discussion. Excellent. What's Unfortunately, your I can't remember the name. That's okay. People can Google it today. Um, what's your favorite time of day? Uh, between 5, 4.30 and 6 o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. I spend an hour, usually, uh, listening to podcasts and trying to learn something. Excellent. What's your favorite app? LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Good one. What's your pet peeve? Lack of passion. If you had to pick one food to eat forever, what would you eat? I think we know the answer. <laughs> yeah, it'd probably be barbecue. Barbecue. There you go. We, we came up on that earlier. I swear yeah. David did not know that question was coming <laughs> in his earlier conversation. Um, what is your go-to for having a good laugh? Oh, go to for having a good laugh. My dad. Your dad. There you go. That's a great one. Well, thank you again, David, for joining us on this inaugural uh, episode of the people behind the performance. Uh, Just for a moment, you mentioned Real Foundations earlier, but where can everyone find out more about you and about Real Foundations online? Um, Uh, Yeah, we have a website, www.realfoundations.net. I wish it were shorter. We've tried to get RF.net for 22 years. Can't afford it. Yeah. Uh, Cause somebody's sitting on it, but you can, you can find out about it there. Give us a call. We're accessible on social media and all the other channels. There you go. Well, thank you again for joining us. And again, Donald Davidoff signing off. Thanks for having me. episode of the people behind the performance. Thanks, David.